morning or afternoon, depending on where you are connecting in from today. And I'm really grateful that you were able to join us. My name is Suzanne Goldberg, and I'm the Director of Public Policy for Canada for ChargePoint. Um, if you're not familiar with ChargePoint, we're a leading EV charging network and equipment manufacturer providing a full comprehensive suite of solutions. Um, and our goal is to make it easier uh, to move all goods and people on electricity. On behalf of the Infrastructure Lab and our wonderful uh, panelists here, I'd like to welcome you all to our first Challenge Series Dialogue. Over the next six months, this series will facilitate a conversation on challenges and, and hopefully solutions um, related to our transition to electric mobility in Canada. And we'll cover areas of, of transit, fleet, remote and rural electrification and more. Um, today, our dialogue is focused on utility engagement and electrification. And I'm really excited for this discussion because we have an amazing panel that brings quite a diverse diversity of perspectives on, on the question of how can utilities play a key role in accelerating the transition to transportation electrification? What is their role relative to government and private sector? And how can they play this role while supporting consumers and ratepayers and helping to foster private investment. Now, um, I think we all know there's a wide range of perspectives on, on what this role is and how best to facilitate it. For example, we, we've seen some success in US jurisdictions that have implemented um, comprehensive transportation electrification planning processes that essentially set the framework for how utilities can support transportation electrification, protect competitive markets and ratepayers, and, and this includes, you know, setting the ground rules for investments, rate application evaluation, rate design, as, as well as um, some guidance around load management. Our goal for today is to have a constructive dialogue, draw on what has worked or not um, in other jurisdictions, and, you know, really evaluate how these lessons learned can be applied in the Canadian context. In Canada, we have uh, very ambitious but achievable electrification goals, and to meet them, we really need to look strategically at how utility planning, investment, grid management, and rates can be leveraged to get us there. So before I hand it over to our amazing moderator, Kara Clareman, who I'm sure needs no introduction, but I will give one anyway, I wanted to take care of some housekeeping items. One, you might hear my dog, so apologies. Um, number two, the format of this webinar is about 40 minutes of facilitated dialogue, followed by Q&A. And as you all know, you're on mute, so we will be facilitating Q&A through that Q&A button at the bottom of Zoom that everyone is probably all too familiar with. Um, the folks at the Infrastructure Lab will be monitoring that and supporting Kara. Um, I also want to let folks know that we are recording this session and it will be available shortly after on the Infrastructure Lab website. And we'll also be sending out an email with a link and some of the key takeaways from today. So with that, because no one came to hear me talk, but <laughs> the panelists, um, I'm extremely happy to introduce Kara Clareman. And I can't think of anyone better place to facilitate this, this dialogue given her, her background. Um, and if you didn't know, Kara spent 12 years working at OPG in various uh, different capacities. But uh, just a short introduction to Kara. Kara is the president and CEO of Plug and Drive, which is a nonprofit helping to accelerate the deployment of EVs. And they do an amazing job at educating and awareness uh, when it comes to the benefits and economic and environmental benefits of electric mobility. And Kara has really taken this plug and drive concept and, and really blown it um, up to something that is, is more of a, a movement. And um, it, she's an extremely widely recognized leader in the EV space. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Kara and we'll begin our, our session. Thank you so much for that nice introduction, Susie. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Uh, as all you folks know, we're talking today about the key role that utilities uh, do play and will play in the future in the electrification of, of transportation. Um, I think we all recognize that uh, electrifying transportation is gonna have a huge impact on utilities in terms of the way that they're regulated, in terms of capacity building, in terms of distribution and, and, and every aspect. Um, and I think today what we're hoping to do is take a look at some of the jurisdictions that are 
ahead that are really doing this well and perhaps look at ourselves and see what we can do better and what we can learn from other jurisdictions um, to make sure we really take advantage of everything electrification we can provide. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to just very, very briefly introduce our panelists. And, uh, and then I'm going to give them each a minute or two just to introduce themselves and to sort of make some introductory remarks. Uh, then we're going to do some facilitated questions. And I really hope we're going to get to some questions from, from this group in the audience. So um, with that, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to just introduce you. And if you can just wave, and then I'll give you each a, a chance to introduce yourselves. So first, I have uh, just following the way things look on my screen. Uh, Daniel Carr, who's the head of Smart Cities for Electra, and I'm sure most of you know that Electra is uh, a distribution utility here in Ontario, one of the largest ones that we have. Next, uh, we have Ted Wigdor, who's the Vice President, Policy, Government and Corporate Affairs uh, for the Electricity Distributors Association, and that association, of course, is uh, all the distributors, virtually all the distributors across uh, Ontario. Uh, next, we have Maria Bocanegra, and she's the commissioner at Illinois Commerce Commission, and she's really uh, key to this panel in our view, just helping us to see some of what's happening in the United States and uh, some jurisdictions that really are uh, leading the way in terms of regulating uh, and, and making electrification more possible. Uh, and finally, uh, last but not least, Reagan Bond, who's a partner at Dunsky Energy and Climate Advisors. And she's done work, of course, on both sides of the border with both Canadian and American utilities and will bring uh, a national and international perspective um, to this issue. So as I said, I'm gonna give each panelist a minute or two to introduce themselves and provide some context in terms of their perspective on the issue of the role of utilities in electrification. And uh, Ted, if you can kick it off for us, that would be great. And then I will uh, help make sure who knows who's going next. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, Kara. Uh, and it's uh, my pleasure to be sharing this virtual stage uh, with, uh, with my esteemed colleagues. Uh, just very quickly, the Electricity Distributors Association, as Kara mentioned, it represents uh, virtually all of the uh, local distribution companies in Ontario, anywhere from a thousand customers to well over a million customers. Um, we look at all issues around electricity from the perspective of the, not just of the utility, but all the uh, but of companies that provide goods and services to support utilities. And really looking forward to this discussion and learning from success stories of, of other jurisdictions, because uh, in Ontario, we have a tremendous opportunity ahead of us, but also some challenges. And it's great if we uh, work together proactively rather than responding to the issues as they emerge. Wonderful, thanks, Ted. Uh, let's go uh, next to Daniel Carr. Hi there, uh, thanks for the introduction, Kara. Glad to be here with you all today. Uh, so I'm Daniel Carr, I'm the head of uh, the Smart Cities team at Electra in our great center where we are looking at uh, future uh, technologies and business models to try and understand their impact on the utility. And uh, you know, one of the biggest impacts that's gonna be on the utility in the next 20 years is, e is the advent of e-mobility. And uh, we see it as an opportunity for us to strengthen our relationship with our customers, um, and to, uh, to identify our, our planning needs. But there's also a lot more that we can do as well to help support our customers as they go through that journey. And uh, aside from just obviously providing the electrons that go through there, but obviously that's a very big part of it. Um, but a lot that we can do in terms of advisory support, um, make ready infrastructure, um, smart charging and other, other things like that. But the role for the utility is a little bit still in a bit of a gray area. And so that's something uh, I'd like to see going forward is a little bit more uh, clarity and, and opportunity for the uh, utility to provide that role and support our customers. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Okay, next, uh, Reagan Vaughn from Dunsky. Thanks, Kara. Uh, good day. It's great to be here. Um, as Kara said, my name is Reagan Vaughn. I'm a partner at Dunsky Energy and Climate Advisors. For those that are not familiar with us, we are a Canadian-based uh, consultancy firm who, for the last 18 years, have been focused on the climate and the clean energy transition. Um, so we focus and support clients, primarily governments uh, at all levels, federal, provincial, and municipal, as well as utilities um, and everything related to clean energy. And um, so specifically in our mobility practice, um, we've helped, I would say, utilities in every province of Canada, um, bar none, with various aspects of electricity transportation, whether it is from planning, regulatory support, modeling, program design, 
Um, uh, we've helped from many different perspectives. So I think, uh, yeah, today I'm hoping to bring that kind of cross country perspective. And also um, we've worked a lot with governments and municipalities. And so would like to bring that to discussion today as well. Wonderful, thanks Reagan. And uh, last but not least, Maria Bocanegra. Yeah, thank you everybody. It's great to be here. Um, so as you said, my name is Maria Bocanegra. I'm one of five commissioners here in Illinois where we regulate our largest investor owned electric utilities, uh, including gas and water actually. But um, you know, as it pertains to the focus of today's conversation, um, you know, we are in the midst of enacting and implementing some of our um, EV related legislation. Um, I also serve as a national chair for the EV working group through NARUC, which is our umbrella organization. Um, and I've had the benefit of also participating um, on the advisory council as co-chair for uh, World Research Institute's um, Electric School Bus Initiative, as well as our national EV uh, charging initiative. Um, so there's plenty going on and we are happy to share both local, regional and uh, state efforts. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for those introductions and everyone was so snappy and brief. Thank you. Um, I, I want to, I think, start actually with you, Maria, if you don't mind, and just to sort of hear, I think it's a great way for us to set the, set the stage a little bit, hear about some of the jurisdictions that you really think are leading the way in terms of best practices, whether that's utilities or regulators or both. Um, and then perhaps we can hear from some of our Canadian friends. Yeah, um, so there's a lot of states. I mean, obviously, uh, I think Illinois is on the verge of uh, joining that that list um, as we kind of compile our um, electrification plans. But a few states stand out to me. Um, that's Maryland, um, Minnesota, and obviously California. Um, Florida is is kind of emerging, and North Carolina. Um, but without getting into the specifics for each state, what I will do is kind of highlight some of the topics that are trending in these states rather. So um, one, I think, innovative approach that we're seeing across all of these jurisdictions is staggered um, you know, rebates for the charging stations themselves. Uh, the utilities are offering this. Um, some is depend depending on the jurisdiction and the commission. Some of it's uh, dependent on your income. Some of it is dependent upon where you are located or if the group has been identified as environmental justice or a low income community. And so obviously uh, the rebate increases with each um, you know, identified marker. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing is a lot of multifamily uh, support from the electric utilities um, that can largely include the installation and or ownership of some of these charging stations. And that's everything from level two to DC fast. Um, the other thing is rate design, which I know we'll get into. Um, you know, there's obviously demand charge relief structures, either uh, largely temporary in nature, just to um, enable sort of that uptake in terms of EV adoption and um, EVSC rollout. Uh, the other thing that we're starting to see is very unique rate designs with respect to specific rate classes. So uh, fleets are asking for their own rates. Uh, obviously, public transit wants their own electrified rate um, outside of what they already have. Um, we even have multi-unit dwelling rates. Um, and then, of course, subscription, et cetera. Um, there's also car share programs that are out there, uh, largely um, the designed to be, and again, in lower income environmental justice communities. Um, there's a lot more, but I don't want to dominate the time, but um, there's just so much going on. Um, but all of this stands out to me as some of the emerging examples. Wow, amazing. Uh, thank you, Maria. So what I heard is, you know, rebates, uh, multi-unit, installation of chargers, rate design, car share is kind of like the four big areas that folks are working on. Uh, Reagan, uh, are you aware of other other initiatives and include Canadian jurisdictions if you if you know of any that are uh, leading the way on in any of these categories? Yeah, I mean, I, I really like how Maria um, summarized that. And I think particularly what one of the I think things I've seen, it's a little different in maybe the US versus Canada is I, I think the US is a bit ahead of us in terms of the, the equity and the environmental justice focus. We are seeing it come more into Canada, but I mean, 
the work we do in the, in the US is much more focused there. So I think um, that's something that we in Canada should really keep an eye on. I think we're a little behind, um, particularly in EV infrastructure overall. I mean, when we look at the utilities in the US, um, they tend to have been more involved for longer. Um, and, and what I also notice, um, you know, cause we've, we've done a scan of many of the US utilities and their, their EV infrastructure um, roles for some of our Canadian clients. And we find that um, it's, it's, there's no you know, silver bullet, there's no one thing they're doing. What I think is interesting is they're, they're doing a lot of different things to support EVs. Um, and even on the infrastructure side, so they will have some own, own and operate where they will own and invest in the infrastructure directly, but they'll also have make ready programs and they'll also have rebates. And so it looks like US utilities are taking a um, like a multi pronged approach um, when it comes to infrastructure and charging, as well as the other support mechanisms that were mentioned. Um, so I guess in terms of Canada, I think you know, probably not a surprise to most folks on this phone, probably the leading jurisdictions we look to are typically BC and Quebec, which have the most advanced EV markets. And, and so that also means they have the most advanced systems. And so we're certainly seeing the utilities there have played a really, um, an increasingly accelerated role. Um, I think some of the other places maybe to keep an eye on in Canada or like Atlantic Canada has really um, taken a lot of moves in the last couple of years. Um, and so for example, Newfoundland Hydro and Newfoundland Power, um, had approval from their regulator to invest in charging infrastructure and um, and the other Atlantic provinces have all put out EV rebates this year. So I think, you know, keep an eye on Atlantic Canada as well. Yeah, amazing. I eh? just see uh, some of these smaller jurisdictions really stepping up. Um, and I agree with you, Reagan, like we could do a lot better on the environmental justice uh, side of things. I think in Canada, we have a lot to learn from what's happening in the States. And, and that was actually one of the reasons that uh, Plug and Drive uh, was working on the used EV rebate because used obviously is a lot more affordable, uh, uh, a lot more available. Unfortunately now used vehicles have become so expensive because of the lack of new vehicles, which uh, has kind of dampened it a little bit, but, uh, but totally agree. Um, okay, well maybe um, now I'd like to move to Ted on this because Ted, you kind of have a bird's eye view in Ontario in terms of what the different distributors are doing and whether you have anything to add in terms of sort of some best practices just even within Ontario. Well, I noticed that as Reagan was talking about the different provinces in Canada, she didn't mention Ontario, which is unfortunate. Um, well, so to give Ontario a bit of credit, there, we've had time of use rates for, for over a dozen years now uh, in Ontario. So EV owners have had the opportunity to charge overnight and, and save some money that way. And uh, I'll, so I'll give the ministry some credit in that they are exploring enhanced time of use rates. So that would ultimately like the, presumably result in even lower overnight rates. Uh, so that'll even give additional benefits to, to EV owners. But the one thing that, that we're one, one of the many things that's missing in my opinion, is something that Reagan touched upon with respect to Newfoundland in terms of uh, rate-based and charging infrastructure. And I think that is a very key piece that's missing in Ontario that needs to be explored uh, deeply. Uh, California has begun this and they have a plan of uh, rolling out a quarter of a million charging stations uh, by 2025, which is fabulous. And I think we need to look into something similar here. Um, the OEB, the Ontario Energy Board, uh, for those who aren't uh, based in Ontario, uh, they have a mandate from the Minister of Energy to look at finding, uh, working with LDCs, local distribution companies, to, uh, to get system investments into the grid uh, to support uh, electrification. And I think this is critical. I know the OEB has begun that work, but I would encourage them to uh, move more quickly and more ambitiously in terms of, of the work that needs to be done. Because there's no question, if you believe all the trends and forecasts, electrification is coming and we need to be ready ahead of time with our uh, infrastructure in place as opposed to playing catch up afterwards. Excellent point, excellent point. And then Dan, as someone who works in a larger local distribution company, what are you seeing in terms of prioritization and how your company's approaching electrification? Well, I'd say we're moving forward on a number of different fronts uh, at the same time. And 
you know, there's just different even groups within the utility that needs to be engaged. So for instance, uh, one of the things we're trying to do more of is to educate our customers just because there's still such a lack of knowledge and awareness of, you know, whether an EV is out there for me, what, you know, what does it uh, involve to get charging infrastructure? Where am I going to charge? You know, all that sort of basic stuff that people who are in the industry tend to just overlook and say, yeah, I've known that for years, but a lot of people just don't know that. So we need to do more by making information available on our webpage. Uh, and that includes, you know, tools to not just say like, oh, you know, an EV is, you know, uh, a great choice for you, but say like, what type of EV, you know, did you know about all these different things and care, your organization does great work letting people know about uh, the different types of vehicles that are out there and even letting people test drive them. So, um, you know, we can leverage some of that, but also, you know, making information available, like little tools, uh, you know, for fleets that are looking to, uh, to electrify, you know, like how do they, how do they get to that decision point? Uh, I think there's a lot more uh, work that can be done there. And OPC Hydro has got a, a great advisory service, and uh, we've we've had some chats with them about what they do there, and I think we'd like to do a little bit more on that. Um, some of the other things that are sort of typical process, but that still maybe need to be customized a little bit, include things like our connection process. You have to keep in mind, you know, we've got, you know, typically when people want to have a new electrical service, you know, in their building, it's, you know, something that's attached to the building um, or, you know, they've got an expansion, they need to have a new electrical panel. In the past, it's not really been required to have like a one megawatt, one megawatt service in the middle of a parking lot. Like, why would anyone do that? And so our rules are not uh, set up to accommodate something like that. But when Tesla comes in and wants to set up a supercharger station with 20 charging stations, we need to do something like that. And so uh, we just need to kind of uh, up update our, our, uh, process is just to accommodate the fact that that's the reality. Um, and then I also wanted to touch on two other points. One is uh, incentives, which I think are really important for charging infrastructure. Uh, we do um, have funding available through the federal government to administer uh, funding to uh, organizations that are applying for uh, for funding. And so that's something that we can offer to our customers. It's time limited right now. There's a limited pot of money, but hopefully uh, with the success that the federal government will see, that they'll, they'll extend those programs and make that available. We feel like we're in a really good position to be able to help our customers because they tend to ask us anyways. Uh, these types of questions so if we can say okay yeah you've got the question we can give you some advice but then also we can actually offer you an incentive that's going to help make that business case um, uh, possible uh, that's a really positive development and then finally we talked a little bit about rates uh, we uh, are very much in support of the uh, that low overnight rate that uh, the Ted was discussing, and we we had some previous experience working on that through some pilot work we did with the Ontario Energy Board. Um, so that's a really positive development for residential and small business customers. But uh, there's a lot more that can be done for demand charges uh, to manage those. And and Maria highlighted some of those opportunities there. And I think we'd like to be able to go further um, uh, working with the province and the OEB on on making those a possibility. Yeah, excellent. I mean, there's a lot of work to do, right? I mean, and and I, of course, I have to agree with you, Dan, that, you know, education still is really needed. I mean, honestly thought when I started Plug and Drive 12 years ago that by this time, like everyone would kind of know all about EVs and we'd kind of, I'd kind of work myself out of a job, but uh, it, uh, it seems that there's still a lot of work to do in terms of people understanding the benefits of electric vehicles. Um, even within fleets, uh, where usually you see fleets going first. Uh, so so I, I really applaud the utilities for, for taking the lead on some of this. Um, and with that, I think uh, I'm, I'm really wondering about uh, the investments required. Uh, there's obviously going to have to be a lot invested um, when you think about, okay, we're going to have to build electrical capacity at some point. Um, even though like, so for example, here in Ontario, we do have a lot of excess capacity at night, but at some point, uh, we will need more and in other parts of Canada for sure. And also the infrastructure required and, uh, perhaps additional transmission, we're going to need to perhaps have V to G. We're going to have to, there's a lot of things we're probably going to have to invest in. And I'm just wondering, um, if we could talk about where, should this money be coming from? Should it be coming from ratepayers, taxpayers? Are we going to have to, are we going to have to tax uh, carbon and use that? Uh, I'd be really interested in hearing some of your thoughts on how we're going to pay for all this work that needs to be done. And uh, I don't know if anyone wants to volunteer to go first. I'm happy to kick things off. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, I think this is one of the most interesting questions that we are, we frankly, as like society are going to continue to grapple with because um, you're right. So I think when we talk about electrification, um, 
you know, we use this term beneficial electrification, which I think is really important because I think there really is an opportunity when you think about EVs in particular for it to be beneficial. So for it to be done in a way that um, benefits the driver, that benefits um, rate payers because it actually puts downward pressure on rates if done properly, and then also benefits the environment. Um, and so that's certainly what we've been talking to utilities about. And so while there may be a capital investment, um, there can be an overall net benefit to rate payers. Um, What's interesting is if you also start to expand and not just think about transportation, like many parts of society are gonna electrify when we think about net zero by 2050 targets. So it's, it's you know, increasingly we're being asked to think about, and our clients are thinking about, you can't think about transportation in isolation, right? So how does transportation, then you have space heating electrification, you have industrial electrification. Um, and you know, there's estimates that if, if we hit net zero, broadly speaking, we're gonna to have to double our electricity capacity two or three times, like rough numbers. So. You know, regardless, there will be investment, um, even with managed electrification, which we absolutely have to do. And that's why utilities involvement is so critical that they are the ones that are the stewards of the grid and who else is really able to make sure that um, managed charging happens and V2G and all that stuff. So I guess to the question of who should pay, I think it's a complicated question because I would think that really there are multiple benefits. And so if, if you follow the principle of the, the, the you know, there should be a an allocation of costs to the beneficiaries. Um, there's certainly a broader societal benefit um, an economic benefit from electrification beyond uh, the utility. So, you know, I think we're seeing, and I love Maria's thoughts on this from the States. I think we are seeing um, multiple sources of funding supporting this, you know, Joe Biden's infrastructure bill, we're seeing municipalities, we're seeing multiple levels of government, private sector and utilities. It seems like all contributing towards this. Um, but yeah, I think it's, a, it's not a simple, answer, but my feeling is, firstly, it's not all utilities, is that I'm paying for it. Um, yeah. yeah, I am happy to follow up uh, to Reagan's comments. I think um, for us, you know, here in the United States, there's three sources, especially with the new Biden administration. Um, and so uh, the first, obviously, is ratepayer dollars. And, you know, we're always concerned that those are being expended uh, prudently and, and reasonably. Uh, the second source is obviously the taxpayer dollars, um, and in that regard, um, you know, I don't have all the numbers memorized, but what I can say is with respect to um, addressing capacity issues and a lot of the investments, um, you know, there is money set aside, for example, for, um, you know, we have an EV corridor charging build-out program. Uh, that is designed to uh, put EVSC along our nation's corridors. We have hydrogen technologies uh, that are being uh, looked at in terms of investments. We also have battery storage as um, a way to sort of offset some of these potential transmission investments. Uh, there's federal dollars for those actual transmission investments themselves. Um, at the state level, uh, we also have here in Illinois, um, you know, rebates that we're starting to offer uh, through the utilities uh, for co-locating, for example, solar and uh, battery energy storage systems um, in order to sort of incentivize that capacity carry, you, you know, you were talking about. And the third bucket is shareholder dollars. Um, and so I think to the extent something is not approved or something uh, is going to be pursued on their own by the utility, that's sort of more of a riskier, uh, you know, bucket, if you will, but nevertheless, it, it is something that gets talked about. So um, I think the other issues with respect to capacity outside of the funding sources um, are interconnection issues. Um, you know, that, that does cost money uh, to the utility and there is sort of this cost allocation uh, dispute that takes place quite often amongst, uh, you know, the utilities and some of the developers. Um, and then the last, area I would say that we don't really talk about, but it gets mentioned every now and again, is workforce dollars. Um, you know, we can have all of the ambitions we want uh, with respect to electrification and addressing these capacity issues, but we, at least in the United States, we really have a workforce shortage. Um, you know, not only because of the pandemic, but we have an aging workforce, and um, I'm probably going to age myself, but Nowadays, people don't want to do vocational, you know, or tradesman schools. Everybody wants to be, you know, a social media influencer or, you know, they want to be self-employed. And so um, trying to find the right incentives to, to generate that workforce to support a lot of this is, is also going to be key. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I was thinking, too, uh, listening to both you and Reagan talk about the sources and who should pay. Uh, you know, another another area of benefit, of course, is the health benefit uh, 
especially in cities where the air pollution reduction is actually quite significant and you see a big health benefit to uh, uh, electrification. And of course that means savings in the health sector. So, you know, ta some taxpayer dollars, of course, make, makes a lot of sense. Um, well, Cara, uh, Ted, uh, Ted yeah. and uh, Dan, you want to uh, weigh in on this at all? Well, well, well thank you, Kara, because actually, because I did want to reframe your question rather than who pays, it's more who benefits. And you touched upon the health benefits, of course, the environmental benefits. Uh, so many jurisdictions are aiming for, uh, they have like net zero targets. And obviously electrification of transportation is critical in achieving those results. So those would be a broader benefit, but even bringing it down um, lower, um, looking at uh, just the direct investments in charging infrastructure, um, people may be familiar with the Synapse Energy uh, study uh, out of California that showed that for the investments that are put into charging infrastructure, the revenue that's generated far exceeds the cost of the investments. So don't, let's not think of it as a cost for investing in infrastructure. It may be like upfront cost, but you have longer term return on investments. So as revenue is generated, then the actual rates go down because rates are regulated. It'll go down and save for all electricity customers. So I'd rather think of this as maybe an upfront cost, but these are long-term savings. These are not long-term costs to the system, be it to the rate pay payer or the taxpayer. Yeah, you're definitely preach preaching to the converted over, over here. And I would say the same argument could be made for purchasing an EV, right? Which is like, you're gonna pay now to save later. And I think it's a huge challenge psychologically for humans. Like say, okay, you know, it costs a little bit more upfront, but over time we're gonna save. And I think you're saying in the big picture, that's that's the case as well. Uh, Dan, did you have anything to add on this point about, about who pays or who benefits? I, th I think the topic's been uh, well covered, but I will maybe just add a little bit there. Um, one is just the just to add on a little bit of what Ted was talking about there in terms of who benefits. I think it's important to know like all these things cost money and people they don't, you know obviously don't want to spend money that they don't uh, need to. But um, it's worth noting the fact that we spend you know billions of dollars a year buying gasoline to fuel our vehicles and that money is just like going out like in Ontario we don't have you know any you know gas that we're you know producing pulling out of the ground. So uh, if we were to invest that money in electrical infrastructure that's supporting local businesses and that we're hiring people to maintain here in Ontario, that's actually gonna be a net economic benefit uh, for us here. So I just thought I'd mention that as one of the, uh, uh, the beneficiaries there, um, therefore uh, suggesting that maybe there's a more of a motivation for, for taxpayer funds to be invested there to provide that societal benefit. Um, in terms of the, um, just looking at sort of the ratepayer dollar part, which is the part that you know I deal with the most directly. I think there's the uh, theoretical perspective, which is you know what as Ted was just mentioning, yeah, you know, these are long-term benefits and they should be you know approved because it just makes sense. It's an economic benefit for both you know the utility and for our ratepayers. But then actually successfully making that argument and getting it approved and that sort of thing in the time where you can make the investment to serve the customer need, those are not necessarily the same thing. And and uh, and so I think. Um, more needs to be done to be able to make that possible so that we can plan for the long term, be ready for things. Obviously, we don't want to strand assets. Uh, we don't want to spend money that we don't need to. But where there's the need and we know that it's coming, you know, Reagan mentioned doubling, you know, potentially the, um, uh, the capacity of, our, of utility systems. You know, that's going to cost money. And uh, there's just putting our head in the sand and pretending it's not going to happen or that we haven't figured out how to allocate those costs and therefore need to wait for another four or five years. It's just not feasible. And can I jump in here, Kara? Um, I mean, maybe just to feed onto Dan's point, which I think is so great. So when we work with a lot of utilities, I think one of the challenges we're seeing, there's definitely regulatory challenges. And I know Ted mentioned that about getting approval, making the business case for investment. There's also internal challenges within utilities. And this, this is a whole different way of business. And I think there's broad-based agreement or acknowledgement that transportation is electrifying. This is going to happen. Where the debate is, is on pace of change and exactly how quickly. And again, and I, I worked for utility, actually I worked for Electra alongside Dan for many years. So I, I worked at a utility as well. So I know um, the way the system is set up, utilities understandably have to be kind of conservative and try to be really prudent. They're using public dollars. And so they want to meet needs, but there's a little concern about kind of getting ahead um, and investing too quickly. Um, but it's, you know, I think we're seeing, you know, I'm sure Kara, you know this more than anybody, we're seeing the pace of change is, really rapid, but it's, 
but to be honest, it's sometimes hard to convince utilities about how quickly this change may happen. And so, or for them to convince their regulators. So there's, um, yeah, there's a lot of, um, I'd say lack of alignment still on what the pace of changes and therefore how quickly we need to act. Yeah, I'm definitely seeing that as well in terms of the pace of change. And it really varies from utility to utility depending on their executive team. Yeah, and I'll just maybe add on to that just to highlight that fact. I was talking with some folks in my in my uh, planning team a little while ago, and they were just talking about, you know, if these numbers are real and it's, you know, especially 2030 and beyond that we really see the growth happen, it's like we need to have a new substation every couple of years if, you know, if we see the worst case scenario. And, you know, substations take like seven years to design, build, get approval for having the ground ready. And so if we're still, you know, dithering around, like having questions about whether we should be investing or not, you know, that time's just going get, to get, get eaten up and we're going to have a lot of catch up to do and that's going to be problematic. Yeah, 100%. I mean, these are long lead times. Utilities can't turn stuff around overnight. That's 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 a big a big issue. Uh, and I would just add to what all of you have said, which is really, I think, done a thorough job on this topic. But um, when we think about how government or taxpayer dollars right now are invested, um, we do put taxpayer dollars towards oil and gas quite extensively and and probably some of that is going to have to shift to electrification and maybe it won't actually cost the taxpayer more it will just be different than 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 in the past um and and at this point i i, I have a whole bunch more questions for this uh this panel uh that i'd like to hear the answers to but i see there's some questions from the uh audience and so i'm gonna i'm gonna take a couple of those and uh uh, here's a really interesting one. Is there any uh, plans, legislation, et cetera, uh, intention um, to utilize storage capacity of EVs to help uh, alleviate the grid crunch? So basically, I think saying like, how can V to G or V to E or whatever we're going to call a vehicle to everything uh, help in terms of what might be a capacity crunch over time? Is this, is this too utopian or is this a real thing? Who wants to, who wants to tackle that? Um, I, I can start because I actually think uh, Illinois is, is kind of a, a we've we've tried to address this issue. Um, but so so part of the new legislation um, obviously uh, mandates that our electric utilities develop a suite of programs. We kind of look at it as the floor, and and you know some of that um, hints at B to G technologies or B to G capabilities uh, that would enable something like that. But separately and interestingly, um, you know, we also have a separate track going on for um, battery storage technologies. And so that's a different uh, workshop. It's a different working group. And um, our commission's in the process of putting together our report. It's due to our general assembly the end of May. And, and through that report, we can make, you know, various recommendations. But what we're not, what I haven't seen in that report, uh, which I thought was interesting, was uh, exactly what you just said, Kara. And nobody brought up the idea of using the batteries within, for example, electric school buses or fleets or, you know, any other, um, uh, you know, use case. Um, as something addressing uh, you know, storage issues or capacity issues, uh, but they seem to be talking about that on, on the beneficial electrification side. Uh, and on the battery side, you know, we also have a separate docket open. I, I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, we have to come up with uh, battery storage rebates. Uh, again, that one doesn't contemplate uh, the, um, the use of electric vehicle batteries. And so I think there's an unintentional disconnect, but, um, you know, I think we're working towards that. And so hopefully, um, you know, some of the uh, things can be fixed through future legislation. Uh, so fascinating because I just heard a really interesting lecture from a guy named Jeff Don, who's like a leader in battery research here in Canada. And he was saying that actually we're gonna be so short of lithium and other critical parts of batteries that we'll have to take advantage of the existing batteries in school buses, in cars, in trucks, wherever they are, rather than building separate battery storage because we just won't have enough uh, to be able to do that in the short run, which means it probably isn't utopian, whoever has asked that question, to think that we're gonna need to and use that uh, the vehicles that are out there as you know a supply. Uh, you know, And uh, we did a study, Plug and Drive did a study on how it would work in Ontario and it showed massive benefits both to the grid and to the consumer. Uh, and so th there is, you know, of course, a business case for it if we can actually just get the automakers to provide vehicles that make it possible. Because a lot of you may know, um, 
right now, most of the vehicles don't even have that capability. Anyone else want to weigh in on this subject of V2G storage? I guess quickly, I would say, so I think, you know, I know there's pilots happening in, even in Canada and it's interesting. I would just encourage folks to not forget about like managed charging. So like the flow in, I mean, this is exciting and we also need every charger to be a smart charger and, and have that be the ubiquitous, um, you know, strategy first. Um, I think people kind of jump right to V2G as the sexy uh, technology, but I think it's both and, and to make sure that all charging is smart charging. Yeah, 100%. We can take advantage of, of rate design first before we need V2G. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. And thankfully, here in Ontario, we're starting to see that. And I, I think many other jurisdictions are already, already doing that. Uh, Dan or Ted, and anything to add there? Uh, well, just a, a high level. I mean, a lot of the conversation that we've had up to now has been focused on regulation and specifically around the Ontario Energy Board and what it can do. But you're, now you're touching upon uh, work that needs to be engaged in by the independent electricity system operator, given the expectation of a uh, looming capacity shortage and then longer term energy shortage. Like we've had, uh, we've been in a surplus situation for many years and that's not gonna be the case uh, coming soon. So yes, I believe that storage of batteries and, and other forms of, uh, of distributed energy resources will be a necessary part of this equation to fill that that uh, potential gap down the road, yes. Right, and this kind of leads naturally into uh, sort of how the consumer's gonna get involved. Dan, did you have something to add there? No, go on. Well, I, I, I was actually, no, I was, I was directing this to you, Dan, which is, uh, you know, how are we gonna get the consumer who's now like gonna be a prosumer or whatever, consumers who work with their distributor, how are they gonna get involved in this? Yeah, I, and uh, so I was, I guess, I will just kind of finish the, the previous thought that I had and kind of lead into the next one. Um, just wanted to echo both the points that, that were made there before about the fact that um, V2G is important and part of the, the future supply mix and, you know, will be helpful for resiliency, but also, you know, you can do a lot with just managed charging when, you know, V1G and that's sort of available immediately. The, the V2G stuff is going to take some time just to work through some of those technical issues when you have that kind of resource coming in at scale, um, you know, it's turning places that are not generating electricity into places that now generate electricity and potentially at lots of different places, like it's complicated. Um, but um, the V1G is like available now and, and a lot easier to do and provides a lot of benefits. Now as to how we get customers on board, I think the automakers are a really important piece here. Someone in, uh, in the comments noted here, the, the part about uh, uh, warranties on batteries. Um, and I think that's an important piece. And, and just even the fact that a lot of cars don't even have the capability to, to have that. Um, it's just, you know, the automakers have to be on board and it's something they can do. It's a matter of like, do they want to do it? Do they, what's the risk of like the battery burning out early and having to replace it and all those sorts of things. Like, I think the automakers have a really important uh, part to play here. 100% agree with that, Dan, because I mean, Nissan's doing it, right? They, they offer that capability and I think Mitsubishi as well. And uh, we're gonna see it more and more. Uh, and I think uh, the studies showing that the batteries have so many more cycles in them than anybody thought uh, will kind of get the automakers over their concern about warranty. Um, we'll see that happening over time. Um, also got a really interesting question about, about this issue of cost. And we talked about, you know, who pays and all that. And then we talked about, you know, pay now to save later. And someone said, okay, like it's really hard for businesses to, to pay now to save later when the, you know, the savings don't come for a few years. Is anybody aware of any like interesting financial um, sort of uh, banks perhaps or financial uh, plans that are being put in place by some who that, that can help spread the pain over or help help businesses through sort of this pay now to save later problem? Well, the silence well, suggests we aren't doing very well on, the, on that side. I, I actually, I reached out to a number of banks over the years saying, why isn't somebody providing like a more creative leasing product? Because we know that the customer is going to save over time. And why should it always be sort of a front end loaded thing? But they, they're worried about their investment, right? Like they, they don't want to front load things because of course, then if the vehicle gets totaled or if the person uh can't pay they lose more so has any jurisdiction put something interesting in place there in terms of creative financing not that i'm aware of 
Yeah, I'm not aware of anything specific. I, I just want to say that it's just common business practice that when you invest in something, the payback period is not expected to be immediate. It takes a number of years to get your money back and, and obviously and, uh, and reap the benefits of, uh, of that investment. So it's assumed that, that there's a, like a life cycle. It takes a few years to see those returns. So I don't see why this would, situation would be any different. That's true. That's true. And you see, that's why you see a lot of pension funds investing in the EV uh, charging companies, et cetera, because they're in it for the long term. And I think companies that do tend to make long-term investments tend to see the benefit here. But uh, those that are looking for, you know, big earnings every quarter, you're not going to see those folks <laughs> making big investments in the EV, in the EV space. It's a longer, it's a long game. Um, okay, so we have lots of questions, um, and I think I, I'd like to turn back just uh, to rate design, which we did touch on, but we didn't we didn't spend a lot of time on it. There's been a few questions in the chat on. Uh, who's doing uh, some interesting rate design? Uh, Maria, you mentioned uh, that there's a few interesting examples in the U.S. in terms of demand charge rate design. Perhaps you could give us a little more detail on that. Yeah, I think um, so. Obviously, the issue on the commercial side continues to be the demand charges. Um, and, you know, I think where the rubber meets the road again is, um, you know, justifying to commissioners uh, and public service commissions. Um, why ratepayers should absorb those costs. But um, the biggest thing we're seeing is just temporary uh, reduction in demand charges. Um, there's also been some uh, other initiatives out there that uh, provide for uh, designs that address, you know, a coincident peak and non-coincident peak in an effort to um, reduce some of those charges. Uh, but the biggest thing is the temporary uh, relief. Um, it, anywhere from a year to um, a couple of years on a reporting basis. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think that this is going to be something permanent. Again, I think that the whole purpose of this is really just to encourage uptake uh, on the demand side. Maybe I'll Thanks. jump in here, Kara. Thanks, I, could, I think, um, and, and maybe just to tie the last question as well, I think it's important that we distinguish when we're talking about rates and sort of business cases, there's, um, like EV owners, um, I mean, like res like call it residential EV owners, commercial EV owners, and then there's the charging station owners, like uh, folks that are out there want to invest as public charging infrastructure. And I think they all face somewhat different um, challenges when it comes to investments and then also rate design. So I think, I think maybe the question asked before was a little bit more about EV charging owners, which might be a bit different than users. Um, but I guess uh, as far as rate designs, I think, you know, in Canada, we can look at some interesting stuff happening in British Columbia right now. So where um, actually BC Hydro was uh, recently applied for approval for their public charging rates, and it was actually turned down by the commission. Um, and uh, there was a, a fear that they, that the rates were essentially too low um, and that it would not provide a, a level playing field um, for um, private sector actors to come into the charging market. Um, so there's a, and so the BCI has been asked to come back again. And I think so that's definitely a jurisdiction folks should watch if they're interested in this. So I believe there is some demand relief uh, as part of that, um, but there's definitely a, a live debate about um, uh, how to balance that, that public investment, but also enable private sector investment as well. Um, and then I guess the other one I mentioned off the top was in Newfoundland, where so Newfoundland has got, um, uh, they are investing directly in charging, but they also have a, a, what they call like a make ready program where they would essentially be paying for all the infrastructure up into the charger or um, subsidizing so that uh, to provide, you know, a more favorable business case for those public chargers. Sure. And Ted, do you know if any of the LDCs are, are offering a make ready type of program? Uh, not that I know of just now. Uh, we put forward a, a paper in December uh, uh, encouraging uh, the regulator to allow utilities to be able to rate base those investments and looking at both models, whether it's the make ready or owner operator model. Uh, I believe that either one would still reap benefits to customers, to utilities, to the system as a whole. Yeah, interesting. Uh, maybe maybe someone can put that paper in the chat, Ted, so we can take a look at that. But um, 
one thing that I have seen a few LDCs come out with, uh, which is, you know, offering a service sort of like they currently do for uh, hot water tanks, which is, we'll install your home. Now, this is more for residential customers. We'll install your home charger. Uh, we'll provide it. You don't pay anything. And then you rent it from us 25 bucks a month or 30 bucks a month. Uh, and you don't have to worry about it. And uh, I've seen now a few Ontario LDCs offering something like that. There isn't a lot of uptake yet, but it's it's certainly a model that I think we're going to see more of. Okay, I'm going to take a look here at more questions in the chat. We've got a bunch of folks asking questions. Um, okay, in the meantime, um, I wanted to ask, uh, since we've been talking rate design, some of the questions in the chat, I think there's some confusion around what is a what's a demand charge versus just like a rate reduction. And, and Maria talked about temporary relief. And uh, I mean, Dan, maybe you're well placed to just talk about, you know, demand charge as a specific different issue than sort of a rate uh, rate class other rate classes. Maybe you could explain the difference. Sure. Uh, this is an excellent test for a uh, <laughs> test question that you've given me. Um, oh, I would, sorry it, to put you on the spot. No, no, it's good. Uh, so basically, I would say the demand charge is basically how the utility charges each you know customer over a certain size, usually a commercial customer, is an amount based on how much energy they consume and how much power they use at the peak period. And so a large business that consumes, you know, a thousand kilowatts is going to pay more, you know, 10 times more than one that consumes only a hundred kilowatts because the infrastructure has to be built up to serve that need. And so it's taken basically a measurement taken once a month about what that the facility's peak is. And that's what the what they pay. The uh, the energy charge is basically what you pay for each kilowatt hour that's going through those wires. So um, a customer who uses the same amount of kilowatt hours over a month could pay more or less depending on whether they sort of have a flat consumption or whether it spikes during uh, the peak periods. And so both of them provide benefits. And obviously, if you can you know optimize your consumption, you can lower your costs. How'd I do? Good, good. That's what because I, I think I think I just noticed in the chat some people asking about about demand temporary relief from demand charge and, and just wanting to understand what that meant. Um, so thank you. Um, and uh, something that I would like to hear about, and I, I don't know, uh, you know, hopefully this is something that everyone in the audience will be interested in. So, you know, we're talking about rate design, we're talking about how it's going to be paid for, we're talking about uh, some different innovative programs that different utilities are offering. And so if you are on the executive team of a utility and you're trying to figure out like your EV strategy or your electrification strategy, like what do you think the priorities should be? Like there's so many things here to, to think about. Um, who wants to weigh in on like, how do you prioritize electrification if you're running, for example, a large generator? Come on, who's gonna be brave? I'll try because we, I mean, this is something certainly we've worked with a number of utilities and they are grappling with this. And I think, um, you know, I mentioned that in my previous comment, that I think, you know, the sort of internal change management uh, within utilities broadly in the energy transition is, is an ongoing challenge, right? And, and you're right, I think it's, it's increasing. So electrification transportation in and of itself is a complex issue and it's something, you know, they haven't seen before. And then when you layer on, it's just one of many things utilities are, are facing and one of these changes. So um, it's a really tough question. How do they compare it to cybersecurity and, um, you know, other uh, electrification heating or digitization or, you know, I'm rolling out the smart grid. Like there's a lot of things coming at them. Um, so I think if I narrow, so I'll, I'll narrow within the transportation space you know, certainly with the utilities we've worked with, it's really about looking at their particular context, looking at the role they could play, and then looking around them and saying, what role do they think they should play when they look at what others in their jurisdiction are doing? So looking at their system as a whole, like how much load can they take? What is their provincial government doing? What are their municipalities doing? What are others in the space doing? What is the sort of maturity of the EV market? You know, are there private sector players in there that are keen to play that role? Or are they more in the infancy phase where they really think that it, you know, that needs an extra push? So it is very context specific, I think. You know, are they a, a dense urban packed area? Are they a remote sort of um, uh, really low population density jurisdiction, um, which is likely 
to not ever have strong private investment. So it really does depend. And then I think, but we see most utilities um, tend to focus on um, the, 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 what I said off the top, like for the electrification to be beneficial. So it's about grid management first and foremost. So it's about um, making sure that when electrification happens, that it does so in the most beneficial way possible. So getting that grid management side, and then usually they're interested in educating customers. And so, um, and then, um, you know, potentially offering um, uh, some incentives to help um, with the grid management. I think the things we see utilities less involved in in Canada are things like purchase rebates of vehicles or maybe workforce development. I haven't seen a lot of that yet, but you know, that could happen going forward. Yeah, some great points there. And I guess everything in the context of if you're a rate regulated utility, what are you even allowed to do? Or what do you perceive that you're allowed to do? Because we certainly see a lot of uh, I think, res I want to say resistance, but some concerns that certain things would not be approved, so they don't even get applied for, which is sort of self-limiting. Uh, and that's a thing that I think we all have to work on, which is to say to the regulator, hey, if you send a signal that utilities can't do this, they won't even apply to do it. Uh, so that's so much work. Uh, Ted, do you have anything to add on the on the, on that score? Well, uh, I, I will give a nod to uh, to the OEB, and I'm hoping this uh, gains some traction. Um, <clears throat> they do have their innovation sandbox, and I know that they are uh, revamping it, uh, I guess, to encourage more applications and hopefully to uh, seize some more approvals uh, through that process. So, so they they are starting that, and uh, I would encourage uh, people to uh, to make those applications. Better to well, I guess depending on how much time it takes, but better to apply and not to be accepted. And then you just say, hey, look, I've tried. The regulator isn't doing it, as opposed to stopping yourself from actually uh, going ahead with that with that application. So no, I think you're making a very good point, Kara. Like you, you can't be self-limiting. Um, but also it's, you, you touched upon as regulated entities, there, there's a, there are parameters around the things that utilities can and cannot do. Uh, so, that needs to be clear. Perhaps those boundaries needs to need to be changed somewhat. Uh, but also, it's it's all about the capital investments too. Even if they have the, the the license to go ahead and do something, if they don't have the funds to do it, just because you know budgets need to be approved by the by the regulator, then th then you're, you're sort of hamstrung. Even though you may have that that entitlement, you just don't have the ability to do it. So that's part of the conversation as well. That's a really good point. And actually, this kind of tweaks me to, to ask Maria about transportation electrification planning process in the US and maybe to help address some of these concerns that Ted is raising. Yeah, um, in listening to everyone, I thought I, I'd probably offer the, as you said, the regulatory perspective. Um, and I think, you know, if, if a utility is thinking about what their role is and how to prioritize it, um, I think first and foremost, um, you know, what we see here typically uh, is, you know, integrated distribution planning. And so, you know, we ask our utilities to look uh, on a very specific time horizon. I mean, we're not vertically integrated, so I can't really speak to, you know, vertically integrated ones that might have a resource planning as well. But, um, you know, our time horizon for, for our utilities is, is five years. And, um, you know, when we're asking them to think about uh, beneficial electrification, we're really asking them to look at holistically, how does the transportation electrification plan really fit into the larger goals of, you know, grid modernization, grid management, grid optimization. Um, and so those are kind of the things that we're seeing go, go into a lot of this planning. Um, the other thing I would say, I think you guys touched on this already a little bit, is I really think that the way the electrification is going to be prioritized is largely uh, dictated by what the regulatory framework does and doesn't look like. Um, you know, our utilities are not necessarily incentivized to um, pursue electrification initiatives uh, without some sort of regulatory assurance or legislative assurance that um, these initiatives um, are either able to be rate based or, um, you know, they can otherwise expend those dollars. And so, you know, in Illinois, um, you know, we've directed our utilities to um, accomplish a number of things that look at, you know, environmental health benefits, uh, direct and indirect benefits, um, avoided costs, um, and actually looking at quantifying the actual costs needed uh, to uh, invest in electrification. But um, 
that again, I see it as the floor, not the ceiling. Uh, but it's interesting to, to see uh, some of the utilities and stakeholders kind of approach that very um, cautiously, whether they would agree with that assessment or not. But. Thanks, Maria. That seems so a little bit ahead of, of what uh, what's happening here in Canada, I would say, based on based on my understanding. Um, but uh, but I, I think now we have about 10 minutes to go. And uh, I know People have busy schedules, so we don't want to run over. And so what I would like to give every panelist an opportunity just to make some concluding remarks uh, and to sum up uh, some of what we've heard and what you think perhaps are some of the most important things to take away from this discussion. And uh, Dan, why don't we start with you? <laughs> um, excellent. Okay, well, um, I would, uh, I guess, come back to a couple of things here. Uh, one is there's a lot of opportunities for utilities to be involved and support this process and um, and sort of at the same time, the incentives are not necessarily there for the utility to do that right now, like just in terms of like the regulatory contract and what sort of um, obligations are put on the utility. And so I think there's some opportunity for us to do uh, more there. I think um, uh, a couple other key points here is that um, there are some sort of technical and regulatory issues just in terms of like how we can actually make these resources effective. Uh, like we talked about V2G a little bit, like we didn't talk too much about solar and storage and all those other things, but really EVs are, are part of the broader landscape of distributed energy resources. And um, understanding how those things all fit together is important. Uh, we talked about, you know, smart charging and how beneficial that can be, but at the same time, our experience with that is relatively low. Like we've only got a small percentage of the, the vehicle market that's participating in these programs right now. And even like adoption rates are low. And so what that looks like when we've got 30% of vehicles on the road that are smart charging or that, that are electric and therefore eligible for smart charging is gonna be different than what we have right now. So we need to study these things now so we understand what does that resource look like in the future? Because certainly it has a role, but like how reliable is it? Um, at what times is it accessible? Is it more accessible at certain times than others or in certain areas than others because different consumers have different profiles. So there's a lot of work that needs to get done there to really understand what the nature of these resources really is. And uh, I think I'll, I'll pause there for now and pass around and see if I have any other brilliant thoughts as others chime in. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And I mean, it just makes me think like as an EV driver myself for many years, you know, I, I had no need for a smart charger. I just, you know, have bought a dumb one. And uh, I do think that the utility could incentivize consumers to choose a smart one so that the programs would be available at some point if when, when it's time. And uh, I think we need to, that's a very inexpensive move to make. And I would think that's something we should be doing, you know, ASAP um, to, to make it possible for a utility like yours and all the others uh, to, to offer these programs uh, at, at some point. Uh, otherwise, like what, I'm not gonna replace my charger. Uh, so so uh, it seems to me you're right that we need to be thinking now about what's gonna happen a few years from now. All right, Ted, can I move to you? Sure, thanks, Kara. Uh, first, we need to come up with another name for dumb charger, <laughs> like the, the not smart one. Yeah. It's just <laughs> but, a plug. Yeah, I, I hear you, I hear you. Um, yeah, just one thing uh, I want to mention, and many people in the audience who we cannot see, uh, maybe from Ontario, and they're, they may already be aware of what I'm about to say, but people in other jurisdictions may not. Um, distribution revenue, at least on the residential class, is fixed. So what we're talking about here really is not a cash grab for utilities. That's not what's motivating this discussion. So, because it's not like you, uh, you, you use more electricity then utility revenue is gonna bump up. That's not how it works. But what this really will happen is like, we need utilities to have the ability to invest in the systems that's needed. Whether we're talking public charging stations or whether it's even just local uh, upgrades, like Daniel talked about uh, with future electrification, we'll need to invest in more substations. So utilities need to know where EVs are located so that they know where the investments need to be uh, directed. So I just think that the more we have these discussions and conversations, we can then build on what we're learning from other jurisdictions and then see what benefits Ontario system-wide 
for customers. This will be a long-term benefit for customers, all customers, not just EV owners, and it'll benefit utilities and uh, it'll support government objectives of, of, uh, of their net zero targets. So I, I truly think this is that classic win-win scenario that, that we're discussing. So thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you, Ted, that, that we are uh, really in a situation where all of society benefits and we can't think of any kinds of incentives as just benefiting that individual. They, they benefit uh, everyone. Um, okay, so uh, Reagan, uh, a couple of minutes for a sum up. Sure. Um, so I think a couple of things to me, as we said, transportation electrification, it's happening. That's not up for debate. Um, utilities have to be involved. If we want this to be beneficial, utilities have to be at the table and involved. And their involvement will likely require regulatory changes and or internal changes within their companies to do things differently than they've been doing up until this point. Um, so there's you know, regulatory changes, there's change management internally within utilities. And I would argue it needs to speed up. So you know, the pace of change, there is some uncertainty about this, but when we talk about infrastructure timelines that Dan was talking about, we really don't have that long if we wanna make sure that this is done in the, the best way for infrastructure. Um, and increasingly, we should think less about the risk of being a little off on our forecast uncertainty, but think about the risk of inaction or the risk of being too late. Um, and so, you know, maybe back to the charger example, and we will come to all dumped. What is the risk of having everybody install dump chargers that you then want to rip out a few years later and have to put in smart chargers? So, you know, really thinking about the risk of not just doing, but the risk of waiting or not doing. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Reagan. And uh, now just uh, one left. Maria, can you sum up for us what, uh, what you hope that we can all learn from uh, the US jurisdictions that are doing things really well? Yeah, thank you. I think, um, you know, what came to my mind listening to all of you is I, I really think it number one depends on the goal uh, and, and the role of the utility. I mean, if we're trying to accomplish uh, things that, uh, you know, involve grid management, grid modernization, um, you know, that's a different set of uh, policy approaches, you know, from a regulatory perspective that, you know, we might ask a utility to undertake, or we might want the utility to undertake. Um, if, if the goal is, you know, um, better health outcomes or uh, equity issues, again, you know, those are, those are different frameworks that may help. Um, I, I would say, you know, if there's one thing Canadian utilities can do, um, it, the lowest hanging fruit is, is simply having enabling rate structures that will at least support, uh, you know, the deployment and adoption of EVSD and, and vehicles, um, if, if nothing else. Um, I think other approaches, assuming that the regulatory construct isn't there yet, um, some of the things that don't necessarily require asking for, for, for uh, dollars or investments right just yet, um, you know, think about doing uh, working groups and stakeholder engagement by far, in my opinion, I think the uh, winning proposals that win the most at utility commissions here are the ones that really can demonstrate uh, active stakeholder engagements roles before coming to a commission and, uh, you know, seeking approval for a pilot or for rate design or whatever it's going to be. I think um, another thing that uh, is, is not it's pretty harmless is asking uh, commissions to issue policy guidance, uh, something that's non-binding, but something that can offer some sort of insight into what, uh, you know, uh, provinces or, or, you know, territories goals might be. Um, other things that we do here, you know, workshops, investigations, none of that is binding, uh, but but it does offer a way to start the conversation and, and introduce, um, you know, data and use cases that may be beneficial to, to everyone. Um, another thing that is big here, obviously, with the new administration is collaboration. We're seeing more and more, it's increasingly difficult to not have these conversations without our sister agencies, like our environmental protection agency that's in charge of the Volkswagen settlement funds, um, you know, the federal dollars that are coming from our DOE and, and DOT offices, our own state DOT offices who are in charge of the deployment plans, um, so on and so forth. And so I think that uh, that kind of collaboration is increasingly needed um, to, to really get started. And then the last thing I would say, uh, somebody mentioned the, the ownership issue. Um, you know, I think it, it's very controversial here still in the United States, whether uh, utilities should be allowed to own and operate. Um, you know, I don't 
want to advocate for one opinion or the other, but I will say that, um, you know, without utilities owning and operating, um, you know, you really can't control uh, the reliability, the resiliency, um, and any what I call like rate repricing. So you can have whatever rate design you'd like, but, but how that gets passed on in, in the market is really kind of beyond, uh, you know, a commission's control. Um, and then the last thing I found it interesting that Canada or certain parts of Canada are part of the MISO uh, RTO. And um, I, I don't think they participate in the OMS as much as, you know, the, the states do. But, um, you know, that's one thing that that's one forum where we are definitely talking about electrification and the transmission upgrades that, that are going to be needed. Uh, so definitely is going to impact Canada for sure. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all uh, to all the panelists for your uh, insightful remarks. I know I learned something and uh, I've been working in this space for more than 10 years. So uh, that's a real testament to you and your knowledge and expertise. And thank you to the audience for attending. And I'm gonna pass it over to Jess Nielsen at Infrastructure Lab to take us out. Thanks, Kara. I just wanted to say on behalf of the Infrastructure Lab, um, a sincere thank you to all the panelists today. Uh, and our wonderful moderator for providing such a fascinating and insightful discussion. I um, also want to thank uh, our audience as without you, um, we wouldn't have an event to run. Uh, please give the Infrastructure Lab a follow on social media if you haven't already on Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn um, at the Infrastructure Lab. Uh, we'll be sharing a graphic of lessons learned uh, from today along with a link to the recording to share and revisit later on. Um, and finally, stay tuned for the coming weeks uh, for our next electrification series webinar uh, and have a great day. Mm -hmm.